Um, we're two weeks after Easter in a popular church in my neighborhood. I live in Eagle Rock between uh, Glendale and, um, and Pasadena, part of Los Angeles. And this church that's in the neighborhood, Christian Assembly, Tommy Walker, some may know we sing some of his songs. Uh, there's been the worship leader there for a long time. Well, they purchased billboards at both ends of Colorado, you know, um, I guess it's east and west on Colorado Boulevard that said Easter changed everything, the entire billboard. And then they advertised their Easter services. And yes, we Christians believe that Easter changed everything because it, it did. And we believe as Christians that Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world and rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning to make salvation available to all who believe this. And Jesus obeyed God's plan perfectly when he became our king on the cross. That wasn't the king that even I think the disciples, they weren't even looking for it. None of Israel, nobody expected a king to assume his throne, to have a crown on his head as he was being nailed to the cross. But three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead as in that, and we hail him in that victory chant that a few of us heard in the, in the prelude. And then we know 40 days after Jesus resurrected from the dead, he ascended into, into, the, into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, where he reigns as Lord and Savior of the world. And most, and perhaps all of you here today, believe this. And for those of us who call Jesus Lord, that's a great thing. But God doesn't want to leave us there because he wants that to impact our lives and how we live. Do we think and act like Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life? Does our conduct, our conversation, our character reflect the ways of Christ? Does our character look like Jesus. We're flawed, sinful human beings, but our goal is to help people see Christ when they look at us and, and not see, you know, what's inside of me that is not of Christ. Because when we believe in Jesus as Lord, we are his disciples. And Jesus had a lot to say about what it means to be a disciple and how to live. And the Bible says a lot about that too. And let's, let's go back. I'm going to go back uh, to John 20 before our reading in John 21. It's the evening of Easter Sunday morning when Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And Jesus came to his disciples where they were together in a locked room in a house because they were afraid that they might be arrested and killed like Jesus was. And while they were there, Jesus appeared to them and showed them his pierced hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced. And Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. With these words, Jesus was sending his disciples out to carry out his work in his ministry. And for the last 2,000 years, Jesus has continued to call his disciples out to proclaim his gospel to the world, to the people around us in word and deed. So if we are Jesus' disciples, he is calling you and me to go out as well. And yesterday, I was at Next Steps in Mission that Bishop Keith Andrews of the, our Diocese of Western Anglicans was leading along with a young priest, uh, Father uh, Keith Hartzell from Chicago. And as the bishop was, you know, beginning his address and kind of introducing to us, and he, he, he said the words to us, Jesus calls us to give our lives away in whatever way Jesus will allow us to do 
And I think for those of you who've heard Bishop Keith when he's been here and, and anywhere else, he is big on disciples going out on mission. And he invests a lot of time and energy of that. And, and his life is, is about that because we're called to go out. We've been given a great thing. And that's Jesus. And Jesus wants us to share that with others. Because in the dead, Jesus wants us to be transformed and he wants the world to be transformed. But he's amazingly entrusted so much of that to us. I mean, he works and the Holy Spirit works, but, but we are the people whom he's used for over 2,000 years to preach and proclaim his gospel. Well, you may say that I'm not good enough. Well, you're right in one sense. None of us are. Or, you know, I've really messed up. I've sinned. Yeah, I've done that too. But Jesus doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to transform us as individuals and as a community of the body of Christ. And, you know, if you think, you know, I can't do this. Let's just look at those first 12 disciples. Because they were nobody in Jewish religious circles. They were not educated, you know, in the, the finest, you know, rabbinical schools, and they weren't considered learned people. They weren't members of Congress, the city council, Senate. And that time, you know, was the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling class, the religious ruling class, and, you know, they go by the people who were in that Sanhedrin, you know, were called, I mean, they belonged to sects called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and there were scribes, the teachers of the law, and some would call them also the couldn't sees and the wouldn't sees, because they couldn't and wouldn't see that Jesus was Lord and Savior of the world. So, even though they were great in their own eyes, and they were of a high status in Jewish society, they missed the boat on the, the biggest thing out there, that God was amongst his people. So these disciples and everyone, no matter even people who have that stature, they're normal, everyday, flawed people, just like me and you. As the rector, one of the rectors at my church in New York, Episcopal Church, he would often say, he goes, we're all cracked pots. And that's okay because the potter made us and he knows where those cracks are. And he wants to mold those and, and, and cover up those and even in some ways use those for his good and for his glory. And if you don't, you know, accept to that really, if the disciples can do it, so can we. Let's just look at a, a couple not so great highlights, you know, from their lives. Just before Jesus died, he washed their feet. During, at the time, you know, they were also having his last supper. Well, what did they talk about afterwards? No, not this incredible thing that, that was unthinkable for their, their master teacher, for the Lord to do to wash their feet. I don't even like washing my feet. <laughs> but... They were arguing about who was the greatest amongst the 12 of these. Are you kidding me? The only thing, only, there's only one great person amongst them, and that wasn't them, that was Jesus. And then you go, we obviously know Judas, he did the worst deed of all. He betrayed Jesus, even though he'd gone with him for three years. And then there's Peter, the most eager, the leader of the 12, disciples. He denied Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest when Jesus was, after he'd been arrested. He says, I don't know the man. Even though he said, I'll never deny you, Lord. Not too much earlier than that. But Jesus views these people mightily. So don't think that he can't use you and me for his Father's glory. Don't deny God. Don't question his judgment. Give yourself to what God calls you to do. And most importantly, give your life to Jesus. And I stand here and, and say that because 
not, and not as one who's always done that. For the first half of my life, and we won't count the years, it'll take us too long to get there, but the first half of my life, I really, I didn't know Jesus. I really wasn't following him. Yeah, I went to church at various times, and some, you know, I went for, you know, certain years at a time, but I had other periods when I, when I didn't go. And I wasn't seeking to follow him. I mean, I, I knew there was a God I did. It wasn't that I didn't believe, but, you know, I was just kind of living, you know, living my life. And I'm thankful the last half of my life I've been doing that. But still, there's just, we don't have time for me to go into all of my ways that, that, that I don't live as God has called me to live. So now let's get to chapter 21 and let's go fishing with Jesus. Now that's not what the disciples thought they you know, were doing when they, when they went out. And there's a lot of things going on in John chapter 21 as Jesus revealed himself to his disciples for the third time in John's gospel. He had other appearances in the other, um, in, in the other, um, in the other gospels. The apostle Paul says he appeared to over 500 people. And here in our little passage, he appeared to seven. Um, so, but I want to focus on a, on a few things that we can learn about being a disciple of Jesus because that is our calling. As a, as a Christian. And first I want to start out that it's better to work with Jesus than to go it alone. How many do-it-yourselfers do you have out there? If I can do it, for those of you who watch sports, don't worry, I won't go too far into this, but um, often it's said the athlete, you know what, we got to man up tonight. And so since I got a lot more women in here, if you want to say we got to women up tonight, I don't know, maybe they say that, you know, but that's kind of more a man thing, I think. So, but I, you know, if, if it's not a ladies, I apologize. But that's not the way of the disciple. Yes, we're called to do our part. We're called to do what, what God, what Jesus, the Holy Spirit is, is calling us and leading us to do. But we don't drive the car. If you get the image of a car, there's, a, there's, a, there's one driver. I mean, if you just look at the front seat, there's a driver and there's a passenger seat. And as disciples, we're supposed to be in the passenger seat, going where Jesus wants us to go. But also, we're not there to be, I guess it's better if, you're, if you say, you know what, I'm going to take control, but at least you're letting Jesus in the car. It's better than if you're driving and there's no Jesus there. And sometimes, I just go and do what I think I should be doing. But following Jesus is the way to go. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, what would be the, if you take the negative of that? Maybe, it may not be I can do nothing, you know, if I'm not through Christ. But I would maintain I, we can't do as much without Christ than with Christ. And in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we got our little fishing expedition, in, or just a little night of fishing. And uh, Peter was the one who took the lead to go out fishing, and the rest said, I'm gonna, we're going to come with you. So there are, are seven in, in total. And they go out, they're in the boat, they're not that far from shore, they're out all night. And what do they catch? Nothing. <laughs> so it's daybreak, and this voice, I mean, it's Jesus, but they don't know it, called out to them from the shore in verse 5. Friends, you don't have any fish, do you? That friends, I, the gospel I read said children. There's the, the word, the Greek word there denotes, you know, a close relationship, a care for them. I like friends better because they're adults, but. And so they answer, no. And then Jesus told them, cast the net out on the right side of the boat, you idiots. And five, you'll find some. Oh no, wait! I added that. I'm sorry. That wasn't in the. That wasn't in the text. And no, I don't think that. So, but no, not at all. Because these were experienced fishermen. So 
So like one interesting question to ponder is like, why did they listen to this voice who they didn't know who it was? And even if they like knew it was Jesus, I'd even ask, why would they listen to him? He wasn't a fisherman. It'd be like taking it. Take an advice from me. So if you're ever out fishing and you're not catching anything, and I happen to come along and I give you any advice, do not listen. I'm not sure. I, I think maybe I could cast it and I might get it in the water. But and I don't know. That might not be a, a guaranteed thing. But this voice, because experienced fishermen, they're, they're not going to take advice from somebody that they don't know. But they did. They listened to him. And they caught, and quickly, they caught so many fish. John says 153 to kind of tell us how large a catch that was. That they were not able to bring that net full of fish into the boat. And then another interesting thing is if this thing was overflowing, the nets didn't break. Which was also an interesting thing. And, and this is also, and I'm not really going to go into it too much, but it's also, you could look at it as a picture of the harvest. Because remember, while they're fishermen now, Jesus told them when they first, when he first called Andrew and Peter and James and John, they were fishermen and they were kind of in things, you know, together, um, <clears throat> along with uh, James and John's um, Zebedee, you know, the, the father. Um, but he told them, you're now going to be fishers of men. And that can be a picture. And then that didn't break is God doesn't want. And Jesus, he said, I'm not losing any that you've given to me, Father. That's how precious, you know, when you look now that they're fishers of men, how precious humans are um, to God. But let's get back to the story. It was so, that net was so big. And so full, they couldn't bring it in to the boat, and they're near shore. And then, but John, after he saw the catch, he recognized that it was Jesus, and he said it was the Lord. And then Peter, we see, immediately gets into the water, and then as they, as the as the net is there, the the six disciples, they can't bring that net onto shore, but Peter gets in there. And he grabs the whole thing and he takes it to shore. And that, for me, is an image of, I mean, Peter's a strong man, but there's six other men. That P Peter wasn't operating in his own strength as he was bringing this net on to shore. And that's a picture for us to know that we need to operate in Jesus' strength and not in our own and so I would ask you and I ask myself, how have we experienced Jesus working in our lives and helping us to do things that you could not previously do on your own? And I think for those of you out here who are on the vestry right now, you it's an important role year in, year out, but it's an especially important role for the next year and a half. Because you're beginning to search for the next rector of St. David's. And it's been almost 30 years as Father Jose will retire. It's at the end of you know, 2020. So how many of you are feeling maybe a little overwhelmed by the enormity of this, uh, of this task? That's a big task. For me, you know, at the mission, our budget is often a problem. And it really is a problem now. And I need to rely on the Lord more than ever. I'm not very good at it. And actually, it's kind of a testimony that this is not an easy thing for me to do. When we're at this Next Steps conference, at the you know we were there all day, and at the end, uh, Father Keith Hartzell from Chicago, he prayed for all of us in different groups of, from the different regions in the, in the diocese, and then he went and anointed each person with oil. Well, as he's anointing me, with oil, he kind of, you know, prayed something about that, uh, you know, you need to, you need to, you know, not rely so much on yourself. I mean, it wasn't those quite those words, but he did say something to that effect. So I don't come up here and, and say, oh, you know, this is what you all got to do. I got my own problems, uh, you know, with this. <laughs> because I'll tell you, I, I sometimes, as preachers have said, or, you know, people say you need to let go and you need to let God take 
over. So God and, and Jesus, they don't, he doesn't want us to go it alone. And we don't have to, thankfully. Second, how good are we at seeing Jesus at work in our midst? And uh, I got to confess, I'm not an A student in this either. Um, and as in, in this passage, the risen Lord Jesus didn't call and say, here I am, I'm Jesus. You put this net on the right side of the boat and you're going to catch a fish load. No, he didn't identify himself. But John, you know, recognized it. After the, the nets were full of fish. And I'm sure he recalled when he was first called, when they were out fishing for the whole night and they didn't catch anything and Jesus says, put it over there and all of a sudden they, they caught a bunch of fish. Because this was something that only Jesus could do. Because remember, these were experienced fishermen. And, you know, one commentator pointed out, and this one will just be for free, is, um, and maybe it's not that big a deal, but there is not an instance in the Gospels where the disciples catch any fish on their own. And maybe I should have brought this up in the last section, but once again, emphasizing, you know, how important it is to let, let God take, you know, work you know, in us, but then also, too, when we see something, also to recognize where God is at work. And things like, that's why, I mean, there's many reasons to read our Bibles, to study, to prayer, to pray, you know, to meditate on the Word, because they help us to recognize Jesus in our midst and, and to, to speak in that still, small voice, or in whatever way that He speaks to you, and also seeking more and more of Jesus and asking God to reveal himself because we need God to reveal himself and look over those 40 days after he rose from the dead till he ascended he appeared to his disciples many times because they they needed that they needed that to grow and for him to continue to teach and impart you know the ways of the kingdom of God and what it was like to be his disciple well, those are great things, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He also, in this passage, we see in a small act how he compassionately cares for us and provides for our needs. The disciples are out fishing all night. They're hungry. So Jesus cooked fish for them. It was ready as he called out to them. And then when they brought the fish to shore and he gave them bread to eat breakfast. So it's good for us to think of the ways that God cares and provides for us and provides for the world. The, in the Beatitudes in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, one of those Beatitudes tells us that God comforts those who mourn. For over, it can be, you know, over, uh, you know, bad things that happen to our lives, people that die, Whatever. He heals the sick and the brokenhearted. Sometimes he doesn't do that in the ways that, that we want, but he's always there and he will heal us and, and, and take us along. And so we should be thankful. I know I'm thankful. I've been healed. Um, I've got two new hips. The second one came three months ago. I'm just so glad they, there's this, this can happen right now, especially with the right hip. I, it, would, I, it would be might be very difficult to be up here, you know, in, in, in front of you. Because, like, I can even, let's see, I can go down and, you know, it's getting, it's getting better. It's, it's, it's amazing. But then, yeah. And, um, and there's just, just how much God loves us. And in so many ways, you know, big and small. We should be, we're, we're called to be thankful for that. I'm thankful to my father. He lives in Milwaukee. And he moved into a retirement community about four years ago. Maybe it's over four years ago. Yeah, I think it's four years ago. And it's a Jesuit Roman Catholic. And it's a, it's a big one. And there's a lot of retired priests that live there in different parts of the campus. Well, he met this man, Father Ted, who's a retired Jesuit priest. He was a teacher. He loves the Lord. And he likes to teach about the Lord. Well, they met each other and down in the exercise room. Well, they've carried on this friendship. 
even though now Ted is in a totally in a new wing, that they put him. My dad goes over there every every week. And Father Ted teaches him the Bible. And my dad has grown more in the last two years in his walk with the Lord and even you know now speaking so much more of it through you know Father Ted. And so I'm very thankful for that, but it's also that's part of the, the going out. While Ted doesn't go out like he used to, he's still sowing in. He's spreading the gospel. He's teaching that. And he's really impacted my father's life, you know, tremendously. And, and also my sister, who lives near him about an hour away in Wisconsin. You know, her faith in the last few years has really grown. And I think, you know, my, between the two of them, they see, my dad sees her much more than, than anyone else. And, and it's just, I'm just so thankful, um, you know, for that. And that's one of the things that, you know, Christ cares for us, he loves us, but he also calls us to serve and to love others. Um, as Jesus said in his last words to his disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel, that great, what's known as the Great Commission, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So Jesus compassionately cares for us. He provides for us. He loves us. He does that so much. He also wants to reveal himself to us. He does reveal himself to us, and he wants us to recognize him. And he also wants us to work with him and to, to follow him and to let him take the lead. But he also, and as much as anything else, he wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to want him. And yes, he, he fed them, but he also wanted to be with them when he called to, and said, come and have breakfast. The words aren't there, but it's have breakfast with me. Because Jesus is as or more interested in relationship with him than in anything that we can do for him. And Jesus wants us to experience the joy, the adoration, the refreshment, the restoration, and I could go on and on, that he gives to us when we come to him. How many of you want that? <coughs> I do. We should desperately seek that. But we, we could say that, you know what? I've really messed up in my life. I've been rejected by people. I've hurt people. Why would Jesus want to be in relationship with me? Because he does. And he also tells us this when he said in, in John's gospel, that he said to the Father, I have loved those disciples whom you gave me to the end. And he did this in spite of their failings and even their rejection of him after he was arrested and about to be crucified. And he also tells us that relate about the relationship that he wants because in that great commission I didn't read the last phrase or sentence as he's sending them out. He also promised his disciples remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now I'm going to go a little farther to verses 15 to 18, just to kind of further bring home the points that I've made about not really, you know, God never gives up on us and he wants to transform us in verses 15 to 18, where we see Jesus showing his grace to Peter, the one who denied him three times on the cross before he was crucified. And there were at least, there were the other disciples there, there were six others. Well, they didn't verbally deny him. You know, they cut and ran. Only John was anywhere near close to the cross when Jesus died. Because Jesus restored Peter right in front of the other disciples. Because Peter had publicly denied Jesus. And so now he's going to restore him in front of others. And he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And the third time, Peter got pretty irritated. Yes, Lord, you know I, I love you. Well, you know, Peter, I'm not really sure he knows that, you know, based upon what happened, um, you know, with a week and a half ago. But he did this so that he needed to push Peter to make sure that his repentance was real. And this should encourage us. P 
Peter did one of the worst things you can do to the Lord. That's to deny him. And this tells us that no sinner is outside the reach of a loving God who wants to draw all, peop all people unto himself. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. There's a priest. He's kind of a boring priest. Very boring. Um, by the name of Father Charles. <laughs> who used to hang out here. And I, I think we had him here before he moved to, to Florida. You know, um, he often said, this was how he would, he would often, his blessing at the end. Remember the gospel. You are deeply loved. And radically accepted by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Walk in that reality. Live in that reality. Remain in that reality. And let no one or no thing take that from you. And that's such a beautiful summary of the gospel that can't be taken away from us. Jesus said this in John 3.16, that, that famous verse that, that we all know and Hopefully loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Peter denied his Lord. Yet Jesus forgave him. And he gave him the chance to repent and seek forgiveness and restoration. And Jesus wants to and will do the same for you and me. But we have to come to him and open our hearts to him. And we have to keep coming to him. Not just once, but we just keep coming again and again. And, and, and I love the picture what Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. But Jesus not only restored Peter, he went one step further. He restored him to relationship, but he restored him as a leader of the disciples. And Peter showed the great power of Jesus' redeeming grace through his great preaching after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came down, that he proclaimed Christ crucified. In that first sermon he gave in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people believed. Incredible. And then this man who denied Christ, even when a little servant girl came up, oh, you're, you were one of his, weren't you with him? Oh, no, 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 not me. Well, he would never, he didn't do this after Acts chapter 2, even if he was put in prison. And he was. And he was told not to proclaim Jesus. He says, we can't listen to men. I have to proclaim what God has told me to do. And then in our uh, reading in Acts about Paul, he was called Saul. This was one bad this was, one, this was one real bad Jew who persecuted Christians. He was a bad man. And then that, that Ananias, he was so bad. I mean, I'm telling you, if I'm Ananias and the Lord says that to me, I am running like you wouldn't believe. Well, I'm going to go talk to that man? My death sentence? No, that, he was a... He was, he was, and Paul tells us about that in his writings. But after Jesus met him for three days on the Damascus Road, he prepared Paul to be one of the greatest apostles in the Bible. And he wrote 13 of our 27 New Testament epistles. So don't think that God can't use you and me. Because I don't think any of us have done a couple of these bad things, some of these bad things that that we see in scripture. They're, these people, they are great men, but they're great because of what God did through them. So we need to be encouraged, but also that's our call to share the gospel in word and deed. And yes, God calls us for service in the kingdom of God, but first and most importantly, God calls us to a relationship. Jesus has made salvation available through a loving faith in him. And he calls us into a life-saving and transforming relationship with him. And because of God's and Jesus' great love for human beings, created in his divine image, as we know, and as I mentioned at the beginning, Jesus gave his life on the cross so that all who believe in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. Loving God in Christ with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength should be the highest priority of our lives. But that doesn't mean we're going to love God perfectly. But the good, one good thing is that he doesn't ask us to do that. Because he knows we can't. He knows our failings, our weaknesses, our needs. He only asks us to desire to love Jesus better, to spend time with him, and to follow him. So the continual cry and desire of our heart should be to put the Lord first in our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And don't let anything or anyone get in the way of that. That's our call today, tomorrow, for the rest of our days. And we can spend, and the great thing is that relationship that, that Christ has made available, us, available to us today is available to us for eternity. Amen. Amen.